Ministry Delivery Service. It's called Expo. It was one of those companies that tries to create a network of services to ensure faster delivery of goods for companies competing with Amazon. The problem is, of course, that no one can compete with Amazon. This meant that the workers in this place had to move faster than ever before and make shortcuts wherever possible to get the boxes with ordered products off the shelves and on to the forklifts because time is money. Miss Linda was rushing like everyone else in Expo that day when she was getting a large box loose from its crate above her head and didn't feel she had the time because she didn't to get the equipment to move the box. The box was too big and it came down on her. She fell to the floor, striking her head. Several workers rushed toward Miss Linda and they realized quickly that she was in serious trouble. A shift manager called 911 and the workers started gathering around Miss Linda and it was then that someone said, get back to work. There's nothing you can do for her. Miss Linda died while her coworkers returned to their separate aisles of the warehouse to claim the next parcel. Studies can calculate the speed of average delivery, the market value of a Lyft or an Uber, depending upon the demand, alongside the penalties for flight delays. But what is the real cost of speed? When I was in seminary, we were required to take a biblical language because Harvard is old school like that. I wasn't partial, frankly, to either Greek or Hebrew, but the schedule for Greek meant that I could take another class I wanted. And so there I found myself in introductory Greek my first year. It's important for you to know, lest you have false expectations, that we were learning Biblical Greek. So unless today you want to converse with me about cubits or the difference between angels and messengers, I'm afraid we'll have a short conversation. Mostly the class for me was a requirement that I plowed my way through by using my photographic memory to quickly memorize a page of vocabulary right before the quiz, walk in, dump what I could remember, pass, and promptly forget it. This went on for the entire semester. Memorize, take the quiz, dump the memory, move on to next week. That was until I got into my second semester of Greek, where we suddenly were in the process of translation. And translation was not an act of memorization. Translation is an art. In our final two weeks of the year, our professor gave us a passage from Ecclesiastes. And my loose translation broke into nonsensical sentences, including, your circles move in to circles. <laughs> I came into class exhausted and circled. I explained the dilemma and my professor smiled. Your translation's actually very close. Ecclesiastes is the philosophic book of the Bible, the wisdom book we are told. It includes passages made famous by song and quotation. You know them, right? To everything there is a season. All is vanity, vanity of vanities. My professor went on, the author is saying that life is in this cycle and that humans try to fight it and resist the way in which time and the earth flows, rivers into other waters, waters into air that rains down back to earth. I was astonished. Here a book created somewhere between the 5th and 3rd century before the Common Era had an esoteric dialogue about precipitation. Facing the finality of death and the success of the wicked and the righteous alike, 
The author concludes at the end of this epic investigation in the mean, into the meaning of life that only two things happen to us all, time and chance. I've always been a fast-paced person. Perhaps some of you can relate. My nickname growing up, given to me by my very introverted parents, was Scorch. <laughs> As in, I would come into a room and depart and scorch the earth. <laughs> my natural pace is uncommonly exhausting. So this is not a sermon about slowing down because I was told that my entire life and found it infuriating and false for the record. I think we each have our own speeds. I've learned this mostly from parenting. Try to compel a soul to change gears and you will be in the endeavor of a lifetime. Much like that passage in Ecclesiastes reminds us. And yet this is exactly what is being done to us as a species because of the gears of mechanisms, ironically, that we initially put in place. We are being compelled to a false and common speed. Some would say for the sake of monetary gain at this point in some circles, it's an existential question of why we are moving as fast as we are moving. Even the scorches of this earth, if propelled unnaturally forward, can no longer hear the music to dance, the rhythm to breathe, and the force within us. What's more is that this movement is leading us to more and more misery. It's lonely when you speed along. I recently listened to a study on speed given in a TED talk where they concluded in the simplest of terms, you know, the only thing that speeding up does is make you go faster. <laughs> Think about it. There's no doubt that we are unnaturally propelled in our society today. Compare our working hours with nearly <laughs> any indigenous society, and it becomes apparent that we have lost our rhythm. There's a teaching among the Greeks, that same philosophy that birthed circles into circles, of understanding two different kinds of time. I've shared them with you before, and this is where at last I get to use that Greek. The two kinds are chronos, Think chronological and kairos. I don't have a word for that one. Chronos is the time that we measure, right? Minutes, seconds, hours, days, time zones. I tried to navigate three time zones this week and found how difficult chronos can be despite it being straightforward. In contrast to Kronos, and it's interesting that we don't use the word Kairos much in English at all, is Kairos time. Kairos is about an opportune time. It's that sense of time and space that moves in accordance with something greater than the units of calculation. Have you ever gotten lost doing something that you absolutely love? And your sense of time almost expands, right? Or shrinks, and you come out of it and you look at the disparity between what you feel within you and what your chronos tells you. That's kairos versus chronos. Similarly, we can find the challenge in kairos when we're tortured, waiting for an important answer, going through the healing process after a surgery, wanting our body to move according to a clock, or when we have walked through the shadow of grief. Kairos time cannot be calculated, and yet it is certainly known. An element of Kairos is discerning the right window. As I spoke a couple weeks ago, the Quakers have that saying, proceed as way opens. It's moving in the sense of opportunity, of the rightness 
of the moment. I recently watched a film called The Biggest Little Farm. Has anybody seen this film, maybe? On a plane? Just saying. It's a good plane movie. It's not about plane crashes, so it makes my list. <laughs> the idea of The Biggest Little Farm is that these two folks, a couple, who are completely unacquainted with farming at all, have a dream living in their small apartment in California of having a farm, and not just any farm. They want to have a farm that uses biodiversity, essentially, to create a balanced ecosystem. So it's a farm that won't be subject to the same kind of pests that monocrop farming we see today struggles with. So they have this dream for years and years, and it's not until they get a border collie by happenstance and get evicted from their apartment that they decide it's time to get the farm. They seek funders and they tell all their friends who make fun of them mercilessly, but eventually give them some money to help them get this farm. And they buy what was formerly a farm in Northern California of just a single crop of fruit trees. And they begin this project with an expert who comes in and gives them good counsel. It's not that they intuit it. And they begin to plant all different kinds of crops and to have all different kinds of animals. And pretty soon, within the first year, they hit some of the challenges of farming, right? The pipe that leads to the aquifer springs a leak and suddenly they have a river in an area where there's not supposed to be a river. At one point, there's an overabundance of snails that, attract, that attack the fruit trees, and then the birds come in and attack the fruit, and they're always trying to balance this. And their expert says, you have to give it time. And so as the film goes on, they take us through year one, year two, year three, year four, and by this point, you're thinking, maybe you should give it up, right? <laughs> How much money have you lost? Year five, a new pest moves in. And everyone in the film, even the expert, is starting to question this idea of biodiversity. Year six. And then at last, they hit year seven. And the expert has told them all along, when you hit year seven, you will start to see patterns and you will start to understand how to respond. So the snails move in again. But in year seven, the entire ecosystem has developed enough that they discover that the ducks that inhabit their pond love snails. <laughs> so much that they eat thousands of them in a season, and the snails are removed as a pest. Piece after piece, they find a way to create balance. The gophers that take over the orchard are suddenly removed, and owls appear. The system comes in to balance. And when the fires hit Northern California and threaten their farm, they are at first held off because they have developed a system of ground planting that has ensured that they have more water in their well than the surrounding farms because the soil was able to hold the water and absorb it down into the water table. And then there is this moment when the fire is coming in and the winds are blowing straight at the farm, when suddenly the winds change. Two things happen to us all, says the writer of Ecclesiastes, time and chance. I went back to Oak Flat this past week to be with the Apache stronghold. I got back actually yesterday evening. They're facing now the imminent removal from their ancestral homelands as we rapidly approach the land transfer to Resolution Copper. 
Wensler asked me and other faith leaders to come out to offer prayers and blessings. He has decided to leave the reservation, which he calls a prison, and to take up residence on these ancestral homelands and to face whatever that means. Knowing full well the dangers of a company like Resolution Copper and their private security that's hired, knowing full well that before that the U.S. Forest Service could remove him. He asked us in this homecoming, this home blessing, to bring him blessings and prayers and rituals that we would share that night around the fire. And I was fully ready to do that. I had a little blessing in my pocket to share. But when we got there, first we had dinner and people were sharing and the time just didn't feel right. So I decided to go with a friend and take a truck around back to set up camp. I had brought a tent for some other folks and get everything ready. And sure enough, our truck got stuck in the mud. And not just any stuck, like a foot and a half stuck, like the axle of the truck was on the ground stuck as the wheels dug in. By the time we dug it out and I made my way back to the camp, the timing really didn't feel right. So I decided I'll share the blessing at dawn. It's fine. Went to bed and woke up well past dawn. I had to get to the airport and it was an hour and a half drive. I packed everything up quickly, got coffee from the fire and Winsler was already gone. He goes off for morning prayers and so I figured my time had passed. I was just about to get in the truck when he came walking down the road. And I knew I didn't really have time. I put my watch back on. We're always asked to take our watches off, to take any metal off when we're on the sacred grounds. But I put it back on because I was just about to get in the truck. Winsor motioned for me to come over. And he started teaching. And I knew that I wasn't going anywhere, flight or not. So I stood and I listened. And then suddenly the circle that had been around us dissipated. And I said, would you mind if I shared a blessing? This feels like the right time. I prayed then as I did today that we would remember who we are. It's increasingly easy at our pace to forget who we are. When I was done with the blessing, I looked down and I was startled to see what appeared to be in that dirt, a diamond in the middle of the desert. But as I bent down to get it, I suddenly realized that the ground was covered with these diamonds. They were tiny crystals of ice that were melting in the sunlight, creating an effect. And as sure as you went to pick one up, it was gone. Miss Linda laid on that floor motionless, unnoticed. And here in this desert, a droplet of water had taken all of my attention. Here where I had no cell phone reception and my watch had been in the car for days, here where my only way to discern time was checking the sun and occasionally going back into the car to sneak a peek. I made it to my flight just on time, exactly on time. 
even without being ruled by Kronos. <coughs> Some of you know that I've been to Oak Flat once before recently, right? I went out over Thanksgiving and I missed my ride out to Oak Flat and I ended up for like two and a half hours standing outside on Thanksgiving day. I'm very over it. <laughs> I think that experience helped me learn and recognize how much Kronos was controlling me, how much I was fighting it. Have you ever driven and you're running late to somewhere and really in the big picture it doesn't matter, but you just get filled with rage? That's Kronos. Have you ever seen someone, or maybe been the person, you don't have to raise your hand, <laughs> whose flight gets delayed, and they're screaming at the person at the counter, right? And in the big picture, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes it does, but most of the time, it doesn't really matter. This season is filled with expectations that are bound up in Kronos. So many of you have lists that are just running out of this door. You probably went through them while we were doing the prayer. That's what I do when I'm not preaching. <laughs> we all have our spiritual development. <laughs> That's Kronos. And all the while we're running for gifts for folks and trying to meet expectations, we're pushing past the kairos, the daily opportunities, the gifts of being together. It's not possible to live in this world and abandon Kronos. I know that. But it is possible, beloved, to not be compelled by it. To mistake droplets of water for diamonds. To match the urgency of the moment where life is fragile and under threat to see where it is strong and vibrant to stand under the splendor of a western sky, to watch the sunrise and not be filled with panic that you're late, to see the full moon creep above the mountains and not wonder what time zone you're in, to look up and notice the flight attendant's face, to pay attention to the pace of change and the opportunities for justice. The hundreds of years, the centuries, and the moments that crystallize into a single life. To note, to take note. To find the pace that is given, not made and to move in its breath as you did at your birth. This is life. May it be ours together to move in and to share. Amen.